Research Talk. As you know, these talks provide us an opportunity to pre present work coming out of the World Bank's research department with the goal of sharing the findings with colleagues inside and outside of our department, as well as with people outside the World Bank. Now we have a platform for doing that easily. Um, I'd like to welcome our online audience, both on WebEx as well as on YouTube. Today's talk is going to focus on tax policy and its impact on efficiency and redistribution. Low-income countries only raise a fraction of the tax revenue that rich countries collect, which limits our ability to provide their ability to provide public goods and invest in human capital, redistribute income, and insure against shocks. So we're going to start with my colleague Pierre Bacas, who will discuss how the difference in economic structure and state capacity can lead to markedly different tax policies across countries. He's going to illustrate some implications of these differences for growth and inequality using results from his recent work. And he'll conclude by discussing some of the challenges to make tax systems more efficient and redistributive. Pierre is an economist in the macro and growth team of the Development Research Group. We're also grateful to have today um, Marcelo Estebao as a discussant today. Marcelo is the Global Director of the World Bank Group's Macroeconomics Trade and Investment Global Practice, MTI. He leads a large team of country economists, macroeconomists, and fiscal policy, debt, and macro modeling experts. He is responsible for overseeing the delivery of the global analytical work on fiscal policy, debt policy, and economics of climate change, for coordinating the strategic direction of MTI and implementing it for helping to shape and oversee MTI's country, regional, and regional programs, and for mobilizing staff to work more effectively across the EFI and other global practices. So, Marcelo, I hope I got your last name right, because on my, on my notes, it's much longer. On the screen, it's much shorter. So tell me if I got it wrong. You did well. You did well. Okay. I don't want to impose the you know, Brazilian slash Portuguese last names to anyone. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so, okay, so um, with that, I'll turn it over to Pierre, who will talk for about 45 minutes, after which we'll hear from Marcelo for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then we'll conclude with the Q&A session um, from questions from the audience. If you have questions, please submit them in the chat function, either in WebEx or YouTube, because we'll be monitoring both of those chats. Uh, so with that, over to you, Pierre. Thank you, Diane. Let me share my screen. Okay. Thank you, Diane, for the introduction and for inviting me to present my work. It's a pleasure to be here. And so today I'll tell you about my field of focus, which is on taxes, inequality, and development. And I'm very excited to do so. As you'll see, it's an active field of research, which I hope I will convince you has some practical and useful uh, lessons for the work we do at the bank in terms of policy making. The talk will follow the following structure. I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of tax policy, especially how it changes across development in the first 10, 12 minutes. And then I'm going to enter into more depth in two of my recent papers, one which, with one which focuses on the role of taxes and its impact on efficiency, and the other one on equity. So let me start with this overview of tax systems and development, and I'm going to take first a very big bird eyes view of, of, of taxes, in particular, what are the key functions of the tax and transfer system? One way to categorize them are those four, maybe in order of kind of, maybe not importance, but the order in the, which they follow with development. The first one, of course, and a lot of our work at the bank is this, is to invest in public goods, infrastructure, health, and education. The second one, which is a second pillar of the bank, is to help reduce market inequality. And this can be done in two ways, through taxes, in particular, to impose progressive taxes, which increases with household incomes. And the second way is through transfers, in particular, the well-targeted and rich, the poorest households in the country. The third role is to provide insurance, in particular, in the context where uh, market insurance might unravel. And so that's the case, for example, for old age, for health, for unemployment. And as we've seen more recently, there's also a big demand for insurance from the state in the context of systemic crisis like the current pandemic. And a fourth goal that we're getting increasingly involved in the climate emergency is to correct for externalities such that reflect the true social cost uh, of goods. Now, against the backdrop, 
A fact maybe you have seen or a relation you have seen is how does tax revenue measured as a percentage of a country's GDP correlate with log GDP per capita? And you can see that there's this strong positive correlation. That is, richest countries in the world, countries in the OECD, collect on average 35% of the GDP in taxes. Well, if you look at the bottom corner of this graph, you see that poorest countries in the world collect 10, maybe 15% of the GDP in taxes. There is some extent to which this varies a little bit across regions. And so here I'm showing you the same figure, but averaging across regions. And you can see, for example, that though South Asia is a little bit richer than sub Saharan Africa, there's a very low tax revenue collection in those countries, similarly for the Middle East and North uh, Africa. Those differences in tax, total tax revenue can be decomposed with the tax instruments that are used in each country. So let me start here. So now I've put groups of countries on the x-axis, starting from the lower income countries going all the way to, to high income countries. And I'm showing you two types of taxes, taxes on trade, that's tariffs, and taxes on corporations. You can see that if you look at this relation, well, if anything, this looks pretty flat or maybe even a decreasing with, with countries' income, right? Now, taxes on trade and corporations are often thought to be easy to enforce taxes. In the case of trade, for example, all you have to do is observe a few big ports, or in the case of corporations, is focus enforcement on some of the large uh, corporations in your countries. The next tax we can add is that on consumption. It's often a big share of total revenue, and you can see that's the case everywhere. And now we start observing a little bit of a relation with, with income, though you can still see that upper middle income countries, once you, when you only have those taxes, collect a bit more than high income countries. And so where does the big gap arise? Well, it's in those next set of taxes that I'm adding here, which are taxes on personal income, on payroll, and on property, and what I call other, which are often taxes on wealth, inheritance, uh, and the likes. And so you can see that it's those taxes, those last three taxes that really explain the big gap we see between poor and rich countries. And that is worrying for two reasons. First, it's because personal income are one of the key instruments to redistribute. So when we saw the second role of the state to redistribute in rich countries, this is done with the personal income tax and increasing marginal tax rate on personal income. And the third role of the state, that of social insurance, is usually achieved with revenue that coming from payroll taxes. And so you can see that the lack of, of existence of, of those taxes in poor countries probably limits uh, what the state can do. Now, before I enter into, into the meat of, of the subject, there's a question I often get is, should governments try to, to actually increase their tax revenue? Is, is that a good objective to have? And I'm not going to provide a definitive answer because it probably depends on, on each country's circumstances. But I think in general, given where we are currently, the answer is on average yes. And that's for a few reasons. First, many countries still collect today under 15% of the GDP in taxes, which is really an insufficient level to meet the, the sustainable goals and more generally provide enough of even that basic infrastructure, health, and education. Second, the current crisis is putting a lot of demand for the government to provide social insurance, but also is deteriorating its fiscal position. And so I think there's little doubt that in this, the aftermath of this crisis, there's going to be a uh, a large push for governments to try to increase their tax revenue. Now, it's important to design taxes which do not impede growth, but keep that in mind, there's few growth success stories that have happened with that, the size of the state increasing quite a bit and providing good infrastructure and insurance. So there's a bit of a chicken and egg problem, if you want, in any case. Secondly, it's clear that in some cases, this and taxes you know, can be inefficient. But even these inefficiencies, they have to be balanced against the fact that there's often very high returns to investment and to redistribution in context uh, with low investment and a lot of inequality. And finally, taxation is more than just an instrument. It's also a way through which citizens in the state interact. And so tax can spur, can spur accountability and better governance. Now, one of the key issues is that taxation is constrained by what governments can observe. Indeed, modern tax systems rely on self-reported activity, which is cross-validated then with a lot of third-party reported data from different sources. So let me give you the typical example you're probably familiar with, which is the relation between employer and employee. If you try to report your salaried income differently than what it really was in a lot of rich countries, you'd have a problem because your, employ uh, your employer would have sent the, the same slip that it sent to you to the tax authority and automatically you, you'd get caught. Right? 
Well, the problem is in poorer countries, information is limited. And that's the case because there's a lot of self-employment, small-scale productions. Production chains are small, so there's not a lot of interaction between firms. And even uh, when there are interactions, there's often incomplete accounting. Right? So the first big constraint is that of information. The second one is even once you have information, you need a given level of administrative capacity to process this information. Modern tax administrations use efficient databases and risk algorithm to detect tax frauds and have incentives to actually detect tax evasion for tax inspectors. Now, not to pick on this, on this tax inspector, but you can see in this kind of messy office that this is something we observe often when we work in country with tax administration, that systems and departments are not always integrated. For example, maybe the tax terms doesn't communicate with the domestic revenue agency. There are few incentives for tax inspectors to detect fraud. And even once they detect fraud, it's often quite hard to apply the law and actually collect the, the, the taxes that are due. So what this shows is that there's some trade-offs in tax policy design. When we often study this in graduate school, for example, and study public finance, the textbook case we see is that of a trade-off between equity and efficiency. Poorer countries also need to consider that there's these information and capacity constraints. And then move this from the world of second best tax policy to that of third best policy. So let me provide you with two examples, and then I'll delve into the two papers that I will, uh, I will discuss today. So the first one is that of consumption taxes. So in the textbook case, when you have no information and capacity constraints, you actually do not care if you are if you levy a tax on value added or a final sales tax. In practice, once you consider these information constraints, value added tax has to be preferred because they collect taxes at each level of production. And this creates incentives for sellers and buyers to cross report on each other. Now, what's interesting is that, for example, Dina Parman showed that this is the case in Chile and that indeed the value added tax is to be preferred to a sales tax. But Chile is a fairly high capacity country. And so recently, there's been some research, for example, by myself, was seen in Pakistan, showing that in countries with weak administrative capacity, VAT is created, and there's a lot of these bogus firms that get created that create fake invoices, and then it becomes a nightmare for the tax administration to try to levy anything. And that's interesting because actually, if you see developments in the last few years, it's the first time ever that a few countries have returned, have left the value added tax and gone back to a sales tax. And so it shows the importance of thinking of both information and capacity constraints. Another example with work by Michael Best and co-authors and some of my work in Costa Rica is that of tax corporate profits. So the efficient thing to do is to tax profits, that is revenue minus all deductible costs that have entered into production. In practice, costs are quite easy to fake and are very responsive to the tax rate. And so these two papers show that a little efficiency cost in terms of revenue is preferable to tax small and medium enterprises on their turnover, their revenue, rather than on their profits. So those were examples of kind of constraint policies and how policies in poor countries might differ quite a bit from the optimal, if you want, policy that is often advised for OECD countries. So today I'm going to take this as a starting point and I'll give you two examples from some, of, from some of my recent work. The first one is going to focus on efficiency and it's going to ask, given limited resources of the audit department, countries may often focus on only the largest firms. What does that mean for aggregate production? And the second paper is going to ask, in a world where there's a what are the equity properties of consumption taxes? So let me delve into the, into the first paper. So this paper is joint work with Roberto Fatal, who's my colleague in the research department, and Anders Jensen at uh, Harvard uh, Kennedy School. The context is the following. Administrative constraints lead to governments often only enforcing taxes on large firms. And so this produces a size-dependent tax, which can have, as you can imagine, negative properties on growth. That is, the effective tax rate faced by firm as they grow increases, and therefore you might want to invest less than is the optimal amount. Uh, and the allocation of resources, for example, labor, is not optimal because often very productive firms do not hire enough labor compared to what they should do, while less productive firms have too much labor. I have two questions. First, to what extent is tax enforcement size dependent, and how does that differ across countries? 
And secondly, what are the, impl what are the implications of this size dependence for aggregate productivity and in explaining the gaps in productivity between rich and poorer countries? We're going to use data that are collected by colleagues from the World Bank Enterprise Survey teams, and so I thank them for these amazing data efforts. And so today, the data you'll see has data from our, over 140 countries. We're going to use specifically the question that asks about tax inspection and tax compliance. And take averages for everything you see at narrow industry levels, and you, I will explain why we do this in a second. So first, let me show you the relation kind of in the raw data, if you want, between the average size of an industry measured with, it, measured with its number of workers and the likelihood of tax inspection that you see on the vertical axis. I'm showing this for the six most populous countries that we have in the data. And you can see that everywhere this relation is positive. For example, in Mexico, uh, a firm at the bottom of the size distribution has a likelihood of tax inspection of 20%, while one at the top at around 60%. So what we actually do in the, in, in the paper is use an instrumental variable. So why is that? The issue with measuring the OLS is that observed firm size in the data might be distorted by the enforcement practice of the tax administration. So the solution we'll use is to proxy for the optimal size of the firm in a context with few distortions. So what we're really saying is that take the US and assume it is indeed an economy without distortions, then the average size of an industry of a firm in the US reflects its true optimal technology size. So what the ID is going to concretely does, do is use ES, US industry size to predict the size of the same industry in the World Bank Enterprise Survey Country. These predicted values in the second stage are then going to be regressed on average inspection of that industry in each of the World Bank Enterprise Survey Country. We find that a firm in an industry with on average 25 workers, compared to a firm in an industry with on average 50 workers, faces a 6% higher probability of tax inspection over a mean of 61%. And that firm also, sorry, I put, put it the wrong way around. It's a firm in the, it's the larger firms, right? That report 6% higher probability of tax inspection and also reports 5.5% more sales to the tax authority. And these results are robust to many specifications that we show in the paper, in particular, they hold even when you only compare very narrow industries with each other. So, for example, take manufacturing of rubber, rubber and plastic products. And that relation holds when you compare rubber manufacturing to plastic manufacturers. It also holds if you only use the panel dimension of the data, which we don't have for all countries, but some countries have repeated surveys. And then we can look as when industry average firm size grows, what happens to tax, tax inspection and tax compliance. Now, for our purposes, what we really care about is how does that result changes with development? And this is what this figure shows you. It shows you the coefficient from this IV regression. Those are the ones with the triangles for different income groups, five groups of uh, countries' income. What you can see is that if you go to the bottom right, you can see that in the richest countries on the sample, basically OECD countries, there's actually a zero size gradient in tax enforcement. As you go to increasingly poorer countries, increasing, and indeed in the poorest countries in the sample, you can see that the tax the, the tax gradient is, is reaches its maximum value and is, for example, twice as large as what it is in upper middle income countries. So, with these results, now we want to ask what are the impacts on efficiency and aggregate productivity. So, we're going to take this result and use a firm dynamics model uh, to ask. What is the effect of having those size dependent taxes that is effective tax rate that increases with firm size on firms? And in the model, firms of different productivity are going to take into account of this, this size dependent taxes, and they're going to choose their production number of workers, their investment intensity, and if they want to enter or exit the economy. The question we ask is what happens to aggregate productivity, which we measure as TFP, if we remove the size dependent tax? So what does it mean to remove a size-dependent tax? Well, I want you to think of the following counterfactuals, that now all firms are going to face the median enforcement intensity in the economy. Right? So instead of this profile that you get a higher effective tax rate as you get larger, now everyone faces the same set at the median level. We're going to calibrate this using the results you've seen, and then technology parameters to match firm-level properties 
as a standard in that literature. So let me show you some of the mechanisms. What happens when you remove those size-dependent taxes? Those figures group on the x-axis different levels of economic development, where five are the richest countries, the OECD countries, if you will. As we've seen in this country, there's no size-dependent taxes, so nothing happens when you remove size-dependent taxes. There's two outcomes I'm showing you here. To the left, you can see average innovation intensity or investment levels, if you want. So as you remove this size dependence in tax and you equalize everyone at the average level, now firms have incentives to invest. That makes them grow, but as they grow, they don't face higher tax rate. And so they invest quite a bit more. You can see that investment levels in the poorest countries in the sample increased by 10% in this kind of factor. On the other hand, everything is not positive because what happens is that for smaller firms, less productive firms, if you want, they were actually facing a very low tax rate, right? That was below that medium we've set. And so some firms now will exit, firms will decide not to enter. And you can see that levels of entry compared to before are now at 80%. So those are two of the mechanisms. What happens then you pass to average firm size? Well, if you combine those two mechanisms, the fact that there's more investment, therefore firms grow, and small firms tend to not enter or exit the economy, well, you see that big increase in firm size, right? And that matches quite well something we know that poorer countries have firms that are too small compared to, 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 to richer countries, right? And you see that this is not trivial. This is about a 30% increase in the average firm size. But what TIP, right? A measure of aggregate productivity. And here you see that in the poorest country, removing size dependence would increase TFP by a little bit less than 1%. So this is not huge, which, which is interesting, right? Because we have this effect on investment. There's also an effect that I haven't shown you on static allocation. You allocate labor better between uh, productive and less productive firms. But you see that that impact, the dynamic impact of exit and entry actually limits a little bit the gains from TFP. Right? And so we get an effect on TFP of about a bit less than a percent. So what I've shown you here is that size dependent enforcement is actually fairly strong and is stronger in lower income countries. And then we've combined this data in a model to shed light on aggregate implication of removing that size dependent taxation. We see that average firm size increases substantially, but aggregate productivity gains are more moderate. Uh, and you know, now this literature that actually studies in those distortions often argues that each single distortion is not that big for TFP and you have to take them all into account. And actually, if you look in the paper, we have, a, we have a, an extension where we think of removing size dependence when you already have a set of other distortion, for example, financial constraints in the economy. And there we find that the aggregate productivity gains are a little bit larger. So this focused on, on, on how constraint policies lead to maybe some inefficiencies. The second paper is going to think of how a constraint, in this case, the existence of an informal sector, is going to impact equity. And that's going to be the equity of consumption tax. This paper is joint work with Lucy Gaden, the University of Warwick, and Anders Jensen, and currently is a working paper in the NBR working paper series. So for the second paper, let me give you a bit of the backdrop, which is a little bit of a big view of what we think are the potential for tax systems to reduce inequality in poorer countries. And that's because of two, two characteristics of those tax systems. First, personal income taxes collection, as we've discussed, is limited. And usually personal income taxes are the key instruments through which taxes can be progressive. The second one is that consumption taxes, which we often think of as a regressive or neutral tax instruments, is a really important part of the tax mix. It's actually, for poor countries, 50% of all the revenue. So if you start from that picture, you, you know the consensus view is that it's actually quite hard for taxes to perform redistribution in this country. We're going to challenge a little bit this view and ask the following question, can tax on consumption actually redistribute? And if so, how? And I want you to think of two potential channels. The first one I'm going to call the all channel, all because it's been discussed for a long time in the literature, is that of rate differentiation. Indeed, you could exempt or set reduced rate on necessity products. In particular, you, a lot of countries' tax policy actually exempts food items or sets a reduced rate. The second channel we'll study is the more novel informality channel. And though you know that has been discussed in the literature, I think we're going to bring the first systematic evidence of this channel. That is that consumption in the informal untaxed sector may actually vary a lot within. 
So how are we going to go about this? So we're going to use household expenditure surveys from 31 countries that we've assembled together. That's micro data for each purchase done by these households, and that covers a bit under half a million households across these countries. The income levels go from some very poor sub-Saharan African countries, such as Burundi, to some of the upper middle income countries in Latin America, such as Chile or Uruguay. Those data, I want you to think, are open diaries of consumption with coverage of all products that can be consumed. And the key restriction, and the reason why we only, only have 31 countries and not, let's say, 100, is that we required that for each item purchased, there's a detailed information on the place of purchase where this item came from. So think of place of purchases, for example, a supermarket versus street sellers. So why do we do this? Well, as you can imagine, taxes paid on purchases are not observed in expenditure service, at least in none of the ones I have. So we're going to rely on this place of purchase variable to try to add in purchases if they belong to the formal or to the informal sector. So we use this place of purchase variable as a proxy. What we're going to do is develop a taxonomy of places of purchases that is going to follow the work of David Lagacos. We're going to define two sectors, the traditional sector, so that's going to be goods that are home produced, that are going to be goods from non-brick and mortar stores, so think of open markets, street sellers and the likes, goods purchased from convenience stores or from individual providers. And that's going to be the definition of the traditional sector. And then we have to define also the modern sector that's going to have specialized branded stores, for example, large stores, and then institutional services. And the assumption we'll make is that purchases in small scale traditional sector do not pay consumption taxes. Now, that can happen either de jure by law or de facto. So de jure it could be in some countries actually small sellers do not have to register for the value buying tax. That is quite a common policy. That policy is often motivated by administrative reasons, that they think that getting after those small firms is too costly for the administration. De facto means that those firms, even when they should be registering, stay under the radar of the tax administration and then do not pay taxes. In the paper, we bring quite a bit of evidence that this categorization we do actually makes sense uh, using census data in a few countries. The note, and I'm, if I have time, I will come back to this later, the traditional sector could still pay taxes through the production chain, especially in a value-added tax system. And there are some adjustments we make in the paper based on data to try to account for it. With this measure now, right, that is we assign the traditional sector to, to be informal, we can now measure the total share of consumption in an economy that is done informal. And that is the relation you see here, which is the total informal consumption share at the country level on a country's log GDP per capita. There's not too many surprises here. You can see that strong negative relation. Countries in Africa that are to the left of this graph, on average, consume 70 or 80% of total consumption informally, while some of the richest countries you can see here at the bottom, for example, Chile, Uruguay, or Costa Rica, that level falls more around 20%. Now, remember what we're after in this paper is not that aggregate relation, but the one within countries. What happens across households get a bit richer and so that's what I'm going to turn to next, and I'm going to take an example using Mexico. What you see here is a fitted graph, right? So imagine there's 20,000 households behind this graph, and I fitted you uh, the best fit line. And we see the informal budget share as a function of household log expenditure per person. So the way to read this graph is at the bottom left, you have households in the bottom decile of the income distribution. And you see that they consume 55% of the, all the consumption from the informal sector or the traditional sector. As you go to a household of the median, where the gray vertical bar is, that falls to 40%. And then for household in the top D side, that falls to 20, 25%. Okay, so you see those strong slopes. The second thing to be observed is that this relation is actually very linear, right? So we can summarize it quite well with just the slope of this line. In the paper, you can see those for the 31 countries we have in the sample if you're interested, but I'm going to summarize this with uh, on, on this graph, right? So I'm just showing you the slopes for the 31 countries we have in the sample. Again, the x-axis is now the log GDP per capita of the country. So two things to take away from this figure. The first one is you can see that in all these countries, those slopes are negatives, right? The, the relation is downward sloping. 
and the substantial, right? The average slope is minus 10. So that means that as the household becomes 10% richer, it consumes one percentage point less from the informal side. Maybe a second observation that is not that you observe a little bit of a U shape, that is in poorer countries, the slope is a little bit lower. It increases for middle income countries and maybe decreases again as countries get richer. What are the implications of these patterns for the progressivity of consumption tax? So remember, progressive tax is a tax for which the rate increases with households total income or total expenditure. Now, consumption taxes are progressive if items consumed disproportionately by the poor are exempted. For example, the traditional sector is exempt or uh, the food sector is exempt. So in this first set of exercise I'm going to do, I'm going to show you some mechanical simulation where I'm going to assume that the government has to collect 10% of its GDP in taxes. And we're going to think of three scenarios. The first scenario is going to apply a uniform tax rate on all goods, but can only tax the modern sector, as is probably realistic. The second scenario is a bit of a counterfactual, counterfactual scenario that I'm going to call the naive policymaker, right? It's someone who wants to create progressive tax, so he's going to exempt food from the tax base, but think that it's possible to tax both modern and traditional goods, right? To actually tax the informal sector. And then the third scenario is going to be one where food is exempted and only the modern sector is going to be taxed. So maybe that's the closest to the actual policy that you might observe uh, in a country. So let's look at the average progressivity of consumption taxes. And for this, we're going to use a look at the tax budget share under each of those scenarios. On the x-axis, you have the d size of the expenditure distribution. I'm going to take the average across the 31 countries. Uniform rate and there was no informal sector, mechanically everyone would be paying 10% by assumption, right? So that, that black line, which you can just think of, is the, what sometimes people think about is the neutral uh, uh, progressivity of consumption tax. Now let's look at the scenario where we now take seriously the existence of the informal sector, right? And so you can only tax the modern sector. And so here you can see that now you get this fairly uh, steep line that reflects the figures you saw before, where on average a household in the bottom decile now pays less than 6% of its budget in taxes, while a household in the top decile pays around 15% of its budget in taxes. Okay. The second thing we can do is now go back to the to, to, uh, counterfactual where we exempt food, but think that we can tax both the modern and traditional sector, right? And that gives you that green line. So that green line is, you know, you can see it makes it somewhat progressive compared to the, to the neutral scenario, a bit less so than just accounting for the informal sector. In and of itself, that green line is not that interesting. What is interesting is to compare it to what actually happens in real life, which is this orange line, right? So now food is exempt and the modern sector is taxed, right? So you cannot tax the informal sector. And so the key message I want you to get from this new orange line is to compare what one might think naively is happening when they exempt food, that is moving from the black line to the green line, which does increase quite a bit progressivity, to what actually happens in practice when one exempts food and the informal sector exists, which is actually to move from that red line to the orange line. And you can see that that marginal gain in product progressivity is actually very small, right, compared to uh, to what you might have thought you were doing uh, on that green line. So that's one of, one of the key messages. Now, I'm going to go quickly over this, but you might wonder, right now I'm showing you this for the average country in the sample, how does progressivity changes with countries at the function of the income levels? So a graph that has on the x-axis the log GDP per capita of the country and show you the effective tax rate paid at the top 20 percent, the top two decides, over that of the bottom two decides. Okay? And then you can see that that's a strongly downward sloping relation. That means that those taxes, you know, including the informal sector in your accounting, implied that taxes on consumption are quite a bit more progressive, and particularly so in the poorest countries. And the logic for that is that in a context where the informal sector is very large, such as is the case in the poor countries, Taxing consumption, formal consumption, is a really good tag of income, if you want. I know with almost certainty in some countries that if I observe consumption in the formal sector, this has to happen from a rich individual. As the informal sector decreases in size, that tagging mechanism weakens, right? And now 
It's still the case that it's majority from richer people, but some consumption in the formal sector also happens from poorer people. So what you've seen is fairly simplistic. And the key reason is that there's no behavioral responses right now, right? So what households and consumers are not allowed to respond to the level of taxes, which is of course unrealistic. So what we do in the second part of the paper is adapt a commodity tax model of diamond and to have two different varieties, a modern and a traditional varieties. And that's the case for each good, right? So you can buy your milk from the informal sector or from the formal sector. As consumers get richer, they want to consume more of the modern variety that is tax. And you can think of maybe that's because of varieties of a higher quality, for example. So there's a taste for quality as you get richer. In this model now, consumers are going to be able to respond to taxes. When you set higher tax rates, that's going to lead to substitution away from the modern varieties and towards those traditional varieties that are taxed. This is going to produce a new type of equity efficiency trade-off. The efficiency logic is going to push tax rates down to prevent too much substitution occurring. The equity reason those we've seen want to have high tax rate because actually taxing formal consumption is good for redistribution. And so the question armed with that model we're going to ask is how do optimal tax rates and inequality change with development? We use for calibration the data patterns you saw before, and then we need to have some elasticities, both product of good elasticities, but something that's harder to find, which is substitution elasticities between modern and traditional varieties. In practice, I'll be honest, we do not have a lot of estimates in the literature, and something that comes close is the elasticity between big brand stores and smaller brand stores. Right? And so we'll use this elasticity that is not exactly the one we need, but that is somewhat akin to it, uh, to calibrate our results. And there's two, two outcomes I want to show you. The first one is how much should you subsidize? And I'm going to say subsidize, they still tax, but you know, how, how much lower should the rate on food be compared to the general tax rate? I'm going to come to that poor naive policymaker, uh, that unfortunate naive policymaker that hasn't realized that there's an informal sector. He lives in the world of figure A to the left. So if you don't account for the informal sector, you see that on average, you actually want to set a rate on food that is about half the rate on all other goods. And if anything, the preferential treatment of food items should be more pronounced in poorer countries. As you now go to the more realistic world where you take into account the formal sector, and so you move from figure A to figure B, you can see that this relation is actually overturned. And if anything, in some of the poorest countries we see in our data, the preferential treatment you want to give to food is actually very small and a fraction of what it was before. The second result is what happens to inequality reduction. So here we're going to look at the change in the Gini coefficient in before and after consumption taxes. Something important is we're not doing anything with the revenue collected, right? So do not think of transfers. Revenue collected are what I'm showing you basically thrown away. And there's a few messages I want to show you here. The first one is that that red dot is the percentage change in Gini from applying a uniform rate to all goods, the one you can only tax, only the formal sector is taxed. And you see that even this very coarse policy produces a drop in Gini of 2.3%, of right? So that's, that's, that's not nothing. If you take the standard view that often you, know, you, you see, and here I'm using data from some of our colleagues from the commitment to equity and a lot of thank you to Gabriela and Chauste and, and her colleagues. The standard view you can see is that first black dot, right? That's the effect when you don't take into account uh, the informal sector of consumption and excise taxes on inequality. And you can see that taking into account the informal sector leads to quite a bit higher redistribution. The second message to highlight is that you can see from the green dot, that's the policy, again, that naive policy, where you can differentiate food, apply a lower rate to food, but you, are, you tax both sectors, right? And so if the naive policymaker against my thing, he's getting a big drop in Gini of three percentage points. Again, that drop is actually a lot too, because the true drop that you're getting is going from that red dot to that orange, okay? Now the optimal policy you can see 
is that orange dot that leads you to, to a drop in Gini of around 3%. That's when you actually optimally differentiate food and non-food items and only in the formal sector is taxed. Now, how big is 3% of a drop in Gini? So there's two ways to see this. One is that it's a lot better than what we thought, and it's actually doing better than what currently personal income tax and social securities do in lower and middle income countries. There's a more negative view, which is to say that we know that in rich countries, personal income tax and social security can get to drops of, you know, in the Gini coefficient of eight, nine, or 10%, right? So that shows you, you know, that there's some moderate redistribution that's occurring, but there's still a long way to go, and very efficient, very equitable tax system are gonna need uh, the development of, of personal income tax. I have a few minutes, so I, I'll tell you about some of the extensions and limitations, and a lot of these are developed in the paper, some of, the, of which we're still working on. The first one is that the pass-through of taxes to the traditional sector may not be zero. In particular, when you apply a value added, it's possible that some of the goods have paid taxes earlier in the production chain. In the paper, we actually do an adjustment using data from Mexico Cent, where all firms report the VAT they paid on both inputs and output, so that you can see in the paper. We also have an ongoing micro study that uses a quasi experiment to measure the pass through of VAT onto the prices in informal retailers. And so for this, we use the fact that in Mexico, municipalities at the border saw a big change in the value added tax. We merged the data on prices with data from the census. And in the census, we can see the status in terms of paying the VAT. The second limitation is that we assume that incidence is entirely borne by consumers. In practice, it might fall partially on workers and on profits of those formal firms. And so a complete analysis, we need to know who are the workers and who are the owners of those formal firms versus informal firms. In practice, that's actually something we can often do. And so we'll, we'll, try, to, we'll try to do this extension. Simplification of this work. Well, first, consumption taxes perform a non trivial redistribution in lower and middle income countries. That does not mean, and I hope that's not the message you're getting out of this, that enforcement should stop focusing on small firms and on the informal sector. There's a lot of reasons, in particular, production efficiency and fairness concerns, competition, that you should still be trying to, to, to level the playing field and, and, and formalize. But there's a strong equity case to exempt small firms, the jury, by low firm taxes. And that case might become more and more important as technology is allowing us now to bring smaller and smaller firms into the tax debt. And we might really want to think of what is the equity consequences of, of, of newer technologies and expanding the tax debt. The last policy recommendation is that should food and more general necessities be exempted from taxes? What well, we show that's actually very hard to justify on equity grounds in poor countries once you take into account the informal sector. There's a stronger case for exempted, exempting food in middle income countries, but then what I hope is that actually what should really happen in those countries is that the personal income tax should be developed and perform more redistribution. So in the five minutes I have left, I'm gonna use those to hopefully, you know, to tired to tell you about more tax research uh, and a little bit on how to try to impact policy. The two papers I showed you have the same structure that they use open source data from a lot of countries and then describe some patterns, which then they read through a model to try to measure their impact on efficiency and non-equity. There's a fast developing complementary approach that is very exciting that use that idea of the economist as a plumber and often uses RCTs. And the idea is to try to improve taxation by tweaking policies and incentives. The method is also very exciting because often they work with digitized administrative data and directly work with the tax administration. So I'm going to take a few selected examples, but I'm happy for anyone interested to, to talk more. For example, Maritomi shows that tax lotteries in Brazil really help with the final stage reporting. That is, final sellers increase by quite a bit the reported uh, sales to the when consumers are incentivized to ask for receipts through those tax lotteries. However, on net, she finds that because you have to redistribute some of that money through the lotteries, there's a large cost and the cost benefit analysis is not very clear on how efficient those policies are. There's also some exciting work by uh, my colleague in the research group, Oyebola Kunogme and, and Victor Pulika, that show that electronic filing, a policy that has become now ubiquitous across countries, 
has no impact actually on average reported taxes, which was interesting, but has very heterogeneous impact as a function of the evasion risk levels of firms. Indeed, high risk evasion firms increase their reported taxes, and presumably because now they pay less bribes, which was shielding them from audits. On the opposite, low evasion risk firms actually decrease the tax payments. And that's probably for the same reason, because before they were overpaying potentially to avoid getting into, uh, uh, into a confrontation with the tax inspector. And a fourth paper, which links to that idea of taxation as being more than just collecting revenue, is the work by Jonathan Weigel that shows in the Democratic Republic of the Congo that broadening the property tax base has some really nice externalities in that it encourages citizens to participate and monitor local governments and then enter into decisions of what public goods to provide. I have left. I want to discuss a little bit how research on taxes and at World Bank can shape a bit what tax policies are doing. The first one I hope that I conveyed is that in lower and middle income countries, tax policies face information capacity constraints. And research is important to help tailor tax design to those constraints, right? And so that, that means that, of course, one size doesn't fit all, but we can go a bit further than that. This might be a correct or an appropriate tax policy given a level of, of uh, information and capacity constraints. Data and technology really promise to help in terms of relieving some of these constraints, but again, they have to be well used, uh, well integrated. And so there's a lot of new challenges that are also arising with data. And as I highlighted, for example, there's some new questions around equity. So let me conclude by saying a little bit of where, where we are and how I see the, the, the next few years. We're all obviously in a, in a very big crisis where I still think that administrative data and data on tax can play a big role. And for example, in some work we've done is using administrative data on firms that are kind of live data. For example, the VAT is reported every month by firms to try to track in real time the economic situation uh, to the extent that the reports are correct. The second thing is a lot of countries are currently designing emergency tax relief and social transfer measures. And we both have a role in play to advise, but then later on to also evaluate what was the impact of this policy. Without a doubt, I think the aftermath is going to put a lot of pressure on public finances and it's going to require a lot of countries to raise revenue once we move from the problematic of debt towards that of, kind of paying the debt. And it's going to be hard, a lot of hard work, and there's going to be a lot of demand to achieve this equitably. And so I, I highlighted three, I think, areas where currently there's actually not a lot of research, in particular because it's hard to get the right data. And we have a lot of work done to, to be done to set the right standards and provide evidence. And that's on the international tax architecture, how to adapt to those multinational corporations, particularly the G digital ones, where the current architecture is really inappropriate to tax them. There's going to be the issues of taxes on income and wealth, especially in a globalized economy with mobile taxpayers. And to meet one of the pressing challenges of our times, there's going to be issues of environmental taxation. And so those are really interesting challenges because all of them have some degree of coordination that is going to be required across countries and where we're going to require a lot more evidence and I hope to be able to contribute and, um, and to bring data uh, to these questions. So thank you very much for listening to me. I'm looking forward to Marcelo's uh, comments and I will make the slides available also for uh, anyone interested. Thank you. Thanks, Pierre. Um, I just want to encourage people, we have a couple of questions that are coming to the WebEx chat. I want to encourage people to add more questions on either the WebEx or the, or the YouTube chat. But um, that over to you, Marcella. Thanks so much, Dion. And um, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I would like to thank uh, Pierre for, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Before I delve a bit into the presentation, let me emphasize the importance of strengthening domestic revenue mobilization and improving capacity to, to collect taxes and, and other revenues in a, I would say, in a transparent, accountable, and equitable manner. I mean, this is very central to the work program we have at the World Bank, you know, to reduce poverty and, 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 and reduce inequality. Um, I mean, domestic revenues from tax and, and on tax sources are the most reliable and, and sustainable way for a country to pursue, to pursue its objective of development and share prosperity, that's particularly true, and Pierre mentioned that, when we see the problems that excessive indebtedness 
has caused to developing countries. A lot of my time in the time of my team is on, on that topics, and that includes the G20, that service suspension initiative, the new IDA policy, sustainable development financing policy. So there's a lot of work dealing with the amount of debt accumulated. And, uh, you know, indeed, I mean, DRM, the national economic mobilization, um, is even more relevant now that the COVID-19 pandemic has increased the gap between domestic revenues and financing needs. In most countries, economic growth is declining and tax bases are shrinking, while spending pressure is increasing. So the pandemic has elevated the need for, for domestic revenue as a reliable source to strengthen resilience and response of countries in the light of the crisis. So I really welcome all, all these research efforts and, and these events. In particular, I mean, we are putting a lot of resources and time and effort in thinking about how to improve domestic revenue mobilization in a moment where countries are getting out of a crisis. So basically how to broaden the tax base without raising the tax burden on individuals that uh, you know already paying enough taxes. So let me start actually by offering a few thoughts on how I view the tax and development research field. Uh, as Pierre also highlighted, effect, effective taxation is constrained by what governments can observe or the information they have, as well as the administrative capacity to implement policies. These are indeed essential elements for strengthening revenue mobilization. And most of the World Bank operations and assistance in developing countries do focus on improving revenue authorities' administrative capacity and, and their ability to access and make use of third-party information. What I would like to add to this equation is the need to build citizen trust, not only to increase revenue collection, but also to improve the quality and transparency of spending. Trust between citizens and their governments can be strengthened by, for example, demonstrating that their hard-earned resources are being used wisely, or by simplifying tax systems, or making the administration, administration less arbitrary. You know, while these elements can be regarded as extensions of administrative capacity, you know, for example, a capable government builds trust and keeps its tax system simple. I like to think of them as complements, uh, you know, and that, that we should explicitly analyze and consider in our systems. So I'll come back to this point at the end, at the end of my discussion. And there's some resources being put also on this question of trust, how to build trust. The idea that paying tax is the most patriotic thing you can do, or one of the most. So that's, I think, it's also an important active uh, agenda. So if I turn on to Pierre's presentation per se, my take from it is the role of third best policies and the importance of micro data for studying questions of optimal taxation in specific situations. Third best uh, assumes that developing country tax, developing country tax authorities face severe information barriers and serious informational constraints. Pierre showed us the unintended consequence of following quote unquote best practice. Best practice often make implicit assumptions about the conditions under which these practices are implemented, such as government capacity and the structure of the economy and agents behavior. So when these conditions are not present, best practice may have unintended consequences. In such cases, it is important to recognize that there are trade-offs in choice involved and that there may not be perfect solution. Now that you have more and more access to micro-level data, uh, such uh, as administrative data, which includes digitalized tax returns, we can obtain one's response and insights to these trade-offs. Ultimately, it allows us to better tailor policy. And I told Pierre before, this is really research that you can, you can kind of sink your teeth into it. It's not abstract, even when you do empirical, as a microeconomist, I've written many papers. Often, I mean, we have abstract policy uh, suggestions, but this type of research agenda, they have very specific policy suggestions, and that is very helpful. In his first presentation, Pierre implicitly described the effect of the best practice to establish large taxpayer units, uh, and maybe more effective enforcement. So he finds that in low and middle income countries, with limited capacity environment, environments, I mean, tax enforcement tends to focus predominantly on, on, on large firms. This is understandable. Uh, if administration do not have the resource to enforce tax compliance across all taxpayers, 
then it is better to focus on the quote unquote big fish. Now, this may, however, have unintended consequences on productivity of these firms, suggest innovation, you know, it, it will suppress innovation and maybe lead to resource misallocation. Several papers have been uh, written on that. Pierre finds that this effect disappears when tax audit becomes more evenly distributed across firm size for rich countries. Um, you know, uh, um, suggestion that with increased capacity, these unintended consequences uh, recede. Um, it, it's, there, there's an interesting aspect to this problem. There's the dynamics between uh, the tax policy that you choose and how firms decide to allocate themselves, including uh, in terms of size. So you, you've seen countries that actually have these special regimes for small firms, actually creating threshold effects and firms not being able, not, not want to be detected or not want to you know, break the law, want to remain small or informal to avoid detection. And, and, uh, and sometimes they are even breaking the law, but they that threshold effects, they doesn't develop that as much, but that's an effect that is important. And in his chart of, uh, you know, this kind of relationship between being more developed and, and having less of a focus on, on, on firm size for, to, 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 to get uh, tax revenues. Um, it's, it's actually codified in many countries. It's not just like uh, uh, operational, you know, direction to, to individuals working tax administration, but it's actually in law. And there is a big discussion of uh, some of these countries have too high of a tax burden given their development uh, you know, development um, in, in terms of GDP per capita, income per capita, but they have too, you know, they have too much tax. So you tend to kind of try to help the smaller firms by creating this, this kind of special, um, special uh, programs, but that's counterproducing. And Pierre produced some evidence on why it can be counterproducing. And uh, um, there's research showing that there's an impact, a negative impact on productivity and all that. Um, anyway, so this dynamic relationship between taxation, firm size, and is quite interesting, something that we should continue to work on it, despite already some results uh, being uh, uh, available. In his second presentation, Pierre described the best practice of redistributive policies in the form of sales, tax exemptions, or necessity goods that is disproportionately uh, consumed by the poor. Typically, these exemptions apply to food, However, he finds that because the poor tend to purchase many of the NSS in the informal sector, such redistributive policies have a limited impact on inequality. Formal food consumption not correlated with income in, in developing countries. There may therefore be more effective instruments in this case to supplement the income of the poor rather than costly, uh, possibly mistargeted tax exemptions. So the fines emphasize the importance of looking not only at the jury, but also the fact uh, the fact of tax structures. Now, I'm not saying, and I do not think Pierre is saying, that should abandon large taxpayer units or that we should have a blanket ban on tax exemptions for goods predominantly consumed by the poor. But Pierre's work encourages us to think carefully through the assumption and consequence of our policy advice. Going back to the point I made about the first part of the presentation, also want you to think about how having this particular uh, exemptions also affect the decisions of firms to work in particular sectors. Um, so it's a little bit different because here I talk about different products, so food production. But going back to the first part of the presentation about size, independently of what type of product you produce, again, these special tax systems and programs uh, can have uh, bad dynamic effects. Uh, now, I want to take a step back and reflect on what this means, um, all, all this means for the broader work that we do here at the World Bank. Uh, as you may know, the World Bank is one of the largest providers of technical assistance and concession financing for building capacity in tax policy formulation, tax administration. So as such, it is important that our advice is underpinned by strong analytical work, like the work presented by Pierre today. Uh, application of such research to concrete country cases can enhance the support the regional teams bring to our client countries and the global units in the research department are really putting a lot of effort to understand how of providing these strong analytical underpinnings for policy work. 
the link with, between research and practice is essential. It's very important that our research, researchers and operational teams continue to work together and learn from each other, taking on board the latest scientific insights, but also the lessons coming from the field. We are uniquely positioned to facilitate this exchange. And I believe actually the second tax conference on tax and personal income and wealth in developing countries, which we have we organized just a few weeks ago, is a good example of these joint efforts. So let me end by identifying some questions for future research. I will raise three areas that I believe will be of critical importance to improve our understanding of, of how tax system uh, work. Uh, first, it is great to see a growing body of research recognize the differences among countries at different levels of income and being able to derive meaningful policy implications that reflect these differences. Looking ahead, I believe we need a framework that allows us to customize efforts to different types of countries. And that actually would apply even when they have the same level of income. Fragile and conflicted affected countries are a good example. And we put a lot of, we are putting more and more resources into studying these countries. They face a unique set of challenges and nearly two thirds of these countries struggle to mobilize significant revenue. Uh, although the World Bank is working with governments in FCB countries to improve revenue mobilization, often in very innovative ways, more research and deeper understanding of various policy scenarios and their impact would be of great value. Second, moving to tax administration, doing his talk, Pierre observed that taxation is constrained by what governments can observe. This implies a focus on tax enforcement. While enforcement is a key determinant of tax compliance, there's some recent World Bank research working paper on innovations in tax compliance, which highlights the complementary roles of facilitation and tax morale for improving tax compliance. Tax morale reflects individual ethics and values, social norms, and the extent of trust in tax systems, with the latter offering the most immediate target for prospective reforms. So uh, the World Bank has supported many reforms in, uh, aimed at facilitating tax compliance in recent years, and is now increasingly exploring the impact of taxpayer trust on tax morale and tax compliance, you know, as well as you know, its potential to contribute to political support for reforms. So this said, although research tells us that tax morale and trust matter, it is hard to formulate specific policies that would raise tax morale and trust. In addition, further research is needed to illustrate how tax morale and trust impact tax compliance and how trust-related interventions can and should be sequenced with other reform areas, notably enforcement and facilitation. For example, when resource and reform opportunities are limited, should a tax authority focus all its efforts on improving uh, audit strategies? Or should it focus more on, say, its redress and appeal system to ensure taxpayers feel treated fairly and equitably? So these are the type of answers, again, you can sink your teeth on if, if you get the answers, and that's very helpful. Finally, if you turn to tax policy, put the research into the optimal mix of tax policies in different contexts remains much needed. The results from Pierre's second paper are very important in this respect, and illustrate how innovative research can yield new and important policy recommendations. So I would encourage practitioners to take note of the findings of how consumption tax rates, informality and equity considerations interact. I hope to see more research in this direction as more micro data become available. The evaluation of distribution impact of tax policy is returning to fashion and its relevance has increased as we emerge from the pandemic. Moreover, increased attention paid to different tax policy mix, which would include green taxes, which is an area that we in the global practice put a lot of emphasis on. The current crisis may provide a window of opportunity on develop a tool on carbon price taxation assessment. We should use this tool and, you know, and, and by the way, we are, this tool is being developed together with IMF and, and other colleagues at the World Bank. And we should use this tool and not analytical device to choose the best tax policy mix to address revenue mobilization and reducing carbon emissions within more equitable you know, tax systems. So let me end on that note. 
look forward to continued discussion on how new research strands can lead to innovative solutions in countries where low capacity, low income, and large informal sectors present severe constraints that need to be overcome to improve revenue collection service delivery. And the name of the game is broadening tax basis uh, and think about where the tax system is not going, how that part of the economy can be reached without really raising the burden uh, on people that are already paying a, a lot of tax and then maybe killing the recovery that we hope is coming very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much for the work, uh, Pierre. Très bien done. Thanks, Marcella, both for the, the reflections, but then also the, the very specific sort of guidance on where you think the research should be going. I think it's very helpful for us to hear, to hear that. Um, Pierre, before turning it back to you, we've got a number of questions on, on WebEx. I'm going to just read out the first three, and then maybe you could respond, you could react to Marcella and maybe address the first three, and then we have, if we have time, we can go to the, the subsequent questions. Um, so the first one comes from Richard. And he asks, does removing size dependent taxes affect aggregate revenue? And if so, by how much? What are the implications of the lost or gain in revenue for poor countries? That's the first question. Um, Isidro asks, could informality be a subsidy to informal firms instead of a subsidy to poor consumers? Could informality be a subsidy to informal firms instead of a subsidy to poor consumers. And then Ishani asks, how should we think about the potential endogeneity of size-based inspection or enforcement? So you've got a mix of sort of general and some very specific, so I don't know how you want to handle that, but I wish you to. Um, see. Yeah, thank you, Marcelo, for this excellent talk. I, you know, I don't think I have there was no specific questions. I, I thank you for putting some pointers or where you see, you know, research being being useful. Um, I thought that you said about, you know, the importance of tax morale and so on. And actually, you know, as you know, there's some exciting work being done, uh, including at the bank, for example, in our group, there's Mavi Shokat who recently joined us and who's doing excellent work exactly on this. I'm trying to link more closely, for example, public goods provision with tax payments, right, and make people realize that the taxes are going to very specific uh, uses. Um, thanks also for mentioning that this question about the optimal tax mix. I think that's a very interesting one. And, you know, one of the things that I think came out of today, we focus a lot of consumption taxes because in practice they're overused if you want. But one of the real question, and I think probably the only way to make tax systems more progressive will be to develop personal income taxes, right? And the question is, how do we how do we do this? And that's really you know a question about the optimal tax mix. Um, and uh, yeah, so thank thank you, Marcel. So let me take the questions in order. So the first one I think is on the revenue uh, consequences of removing size dependent taxes. And so that's an excellent point. And I don't think I hope I, I didn't convey that this is a policy that should be done removing uh, size dependent taxes. Indeed, if you look what happened the last 20 or 30 years, most countries adopted those large tax per units and now actually they're adopting medium tax per units and we're going towards increasing uh, segmentation. There's actually a nice paper out now by Basri, Ben Olken and some co-authors that actually shows that uh, opening a large tax per unit leads to a lot more revenue collection. Uh, so what we did in this paper is actually take the, you know, we, we stayed agnostic about the revenue side. And I think it's great that there's evidence in other papers that tell us that, you know, these policies are good for revenue. But we more wanted to ask is how large are the distortions created? Actually, I think the message is that those distortions are potentially not la that large, right? It's about 1% uh, in terms uh, of TFP. And so I think the total kind of evaluation of this policy would have to bring those two sides together, you know, the distortions and the inefficiencies with the revenue. And depending on how you value revenue, you know, you might think that the policy is optimal or not. Um, so th thank you for this comment. You know, the reason why we didn't go about revenue is I think the data we had to actually measure accurately revenue were a bit too coarse for this. The second question was on informality is that right and is this is rather a subsidy to informal sector okay so that's a very good point and i think you know that's something i mentioned at the end which again i don't think a message or we don't have enough to say that 
that the informal sector should be uh, that, that that formalization should stop, right? And one of the good reasons to keep on formalizing is is exactly that question, which is that there's unfair competition between formal and informal firms, and so that's you know taking it from the production side. What's quite new, I think, in our paper, and no one had I think looked at informality from that angle, is taking more the consumption view, right? And so you know the two can coexist, and I think there's an interesting question of how do they, they all come together, and that's not what we did here. Here we only focus on the consumption side. And show that there's this very strong correlation um, between one's income level and the share consumed in the informal sector. And I think you know that more raises some alarm bells that equity has to be part of our thinking about formalization, about thresholds, about how technology is changing all that, right? And so, you know, point well taken. I think that's an important reason why we formalize in practice. And I think what we're doing here is bringing a, a novel view. The third paper is more specific. It's about endogeneity of, of firm size with respect to the level of taxes. That's a, a very good point. You know, what we try to do in this paper is do this instrumental strategy, these IV strategies, assuming that in the US, you know, it's not a first order concern if you want, that, the, that taxes are maybe more flat with respect to firm size and that firms don't change their size uh, thinking of tax enforcement. You know, in practice, we, you know, that's an assumption, but could, could, you know, could be false. Uh, and that's some of the limitation, like in my answer to Ishan, is that this paper is already published, so we're not going to go back on it. But that's a point well taken, and, you know, that we discussed with the referee, the paper has some robustness to changing that instrument and so on, but uh, not fully solved. Okay, uh, thanks, Pierre. Marcelo, before going to the next set of questions, just want to give you a chance to come in if you wanted to say anything at this point. Fine, if we want to just keep going. I think actually um, one of the questions touched the point that I made about dynamic effects of taxation from size and the decision to become informal and formal. Your paper doesn't quite, certainly the second, doesn't quite address that because you are looking at the consumption side, like you said. Um, but there is a whole discussion in this informality literature that basically tries to understand this informality uh, a result of kind of too demanding institutions given the level of development of a country. And you do see some evidence in countries that have very high tax to GDP ratios, say Brazil, that uh, firms kind of become informal as a way to kind of lower labor costs because they wouldn't even exist if that. And then if you, if you put on top of it a, a, a tax system that basically says you don't need to pay taxes if you're very little, and there is a program like that in Brazil that you pay tax, but you pay less tax, it's simpler and all that. What is happy is that you have more firms migrating to that particular program without addressing the core problem, which is labor costs are too high, given productivity, of course. So, um, I mean, think about these dynamic effects. I think you mentioned some of that in your first presentation about size and and this has an impact on TFP, which is very significant. And several research attributes this kind of bad incentive to become formal in Brazil uh, because of the tax system. And, and, and the solution was, let me make it very simple for some, and then everybody migrate to that. And some people, you know, they don't have 50 employees, they have 49. So they fall into that order. So threshold effects are, are very important there. So anyway, so that's something also that would be interesting to think about the the behavior effect that you you mentioned, I think, in your presentation. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. With that, I'll I'll go to uh, the question from Roman, who I think he's referring to the second paper you were describing. Um, are the preferences non-homothetic, or as in Faber and Fally? the expenditure shares are fixed in each quintile of the expenditure distribution within a country. Then Maria asks, is there convincing evidence on how to improve information and capacity constraints so that these are not taken as given? Going back to the very first premise that you started off with. Um, and then um, a question from Oyabola where she says, curious about the no pass-through result of the VAT increase in Mexico. Don't the informal firms buy from the formal sector? 
for example, processed goods. What do you think explains the results? Thank you, Dan. And then, okay, so, sorry, um, Mike Toman sent a question, which is pretty long, so I'm gonna try to shorten it slightly. Um, thank you for mentioning environmental taxation and and been looking recently at the effects of increasing excise tax on fossil energy to reduce emissions and with concomitant effects on climate change this can increase the tax base and reduce high marginal rates on other formal tax uh, other formal sector taxes um, on the other hand energy expenditure increases with income in some cases with income elasticity greater than one. So energy taxes can be progressive. So then his question is, can tax revenue, uh, sorry, tax revenues that can be used to further increase progressivity through income transfers and or to reduce other taxes? Sorry, I'm, maybe I'll ask, Mike, if he wants to rephrase his question, because I think something got a little bit lost in the last sentence there. And um, could I, I can also take that offline if you want. With, with my... Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, okay, so, okay, so we have the first three. Uh, let me answer. Uh, so, so first, to, to Marcelo's point, you know that that's an excellent one about dynamic incentives of of informality. There's a nice paper actually, in Marcelo, your Brazilian by uh, Gabriel Ulisse at UCL, which maybe you know that really tries to quantify a bit those two views of informality, right? Those two high costs and you're forcing firms to formalize when they shouldn't, and the fact that we still have firms that are informal when really they're fairly productive firms and are really gaming the system. And so that hopefully you know that does provide some answers into a dynamic model to some of those questions. Um, so, so, so that was two point one on, on Rome, That's a fairly technical question. Uh, we allow for non homostatic preferences, but uh, I would be happy to have a discussion with you on if we should follow Faber and Faye, uh in, instead. And uh, you know, what's your recommendation? You know, I'd be happy to tell you more how we actually calibrated um, calibrated the model. Uh, on the more general question of what are we doing or you know is there any any research on how to improve information capacity constraints so i think that's a great point because the two papers i showed takes more the structural view right which is you take these information capacity constraints as given and you say how do we adapt policy to them the other view is to say you know let's try to improve them so that we don't we get rid of them and maybe that slide one before last that I showed started answering some of that, right? It's often, you know, we try to improve those at the margin. That's an exciting literature because we try to use quasi-experiments or RCT. And there's a lot going on in the field. It's, it's quite new. I think the reason that this research, research is fairly new is that before administrative tax data was often hard to get and sometimes not digitized, right? And so in the last five years, we've seen a lot of new research and I think that's going to continue. And that hopefully will have precise answers to the type of uh, technologies or interventions that can help with getting more information. I can tell you, for example, myself with uh, Anne Brockmeyer, also from the World Bank, we've been working in Senegal on how to design risk scoring algorithm for risk for, uh, for firms, and then how to use this information because you can have a good system, but then if it's not being used, there's not much point how to use this to select optimally taxpayers and uh, to incentivize uh, tax inspectors to do so. Uh, so the short answer is yes, there's a lot of going on. I'm happy to answer more by email and uh, to give an update of this in, in a year or two also. Uh, on Oyebola's question, so we have indeed this study in Mexico that finds very limited pass-through of an increase in taxes onto the informal sector. We're, to be honest, we're currently investigating this and work is going slower with the pandemic where we have to send two files to the, set, to, uh, to the statistical office. Uh, it seems to be one, you know, that markets, the formal and informal sector seem to be fairly segmented in this case. And so that could be one way to think of this. There's actually some papers that you will know Ebola by Lucy get and another showing that even within production chains, informal firms tend to interact more with each other where formal firms interact uh, among formal firms. And it could be the same way that consumers uh, of, um, the consumers are very segmented uh, in the consumption, but you know, we don't have a, a, 
a full full result on this. And maybe something relevant is that we find very limited pass through on the informal sector, but we do not find full pass through onto the formal sector. We only find about fifty percent pass through onto the formal sector. So that means that you know a lot of things are happening away from prices that we should try to understand. Uh, I think that's that's the question, right? Yeah. May I to, may I add one thing, a quick thing? Um, it's uh, I, I, your papers don't say anything about you know the first bath. The first bath is still like tax everybody, flat tax. But then you have perfect information, perfect administration. You go back through the income side and just redistribute, um, say all the tax paid by the poor, you just redistribute to them and all that. Now it would be interesting, and I don't know how you do this paper, but to kind of Think about the capacity of, say, key. Let's talk about IDA countries, so the poorest countries uh, that we serve. Uh, some index of uh, administrative capacity to redistributive policies, and and interact that with your results. I mean, in what cases, you know, don't even go there because it's just going to be so regressive, and let's, you know. But in some cases, you see there is some capacity there, and and maybe there has a trade-off between, uh, uh, you know, uh, equity and revenue, uh, capacity to, to mobilize revenue. And then for each country think, you know, maybe this country should have more kind of uniform tax rate and use the capacity to redistribute. I mean, if I talk to particular experts from particular countries, they will have views. But I'm wondering if there's that kind of a more general kind of paper that you can look, and, and even if it's just internal, you know, then you can look at kind of how you see countries in this in this capacity distribution and how they interact with the distributive issues that you mentioned in your paper. Um, anyway, thank you. Uh, thanks, Marcelo. Maybe a, a quick answer to this. I, to my knowledge, there's not such an index currently. I think is one about statistical capacity, right? The capacity of the statistical agency that would be an interesting uh, one to. Uh, that's something that we probably could do at that because in a lot of cases we are the ones interacting with uh, with them. And you know the diamond tools, maybe if you aggregated all those information. So just for everyone, the diamond tool is something developed by the bank that tries to assess among a set of metrics uh, the practices of tax administration. Uh, and the IMF has also a similar tool called TADAT. So, so, so there is information that could be that could be used for that. I think what there isn't necessarily is a mapping from that towards which policies can be implemented, which is what you suggest. There is a project again jointly led by the IMF and the World Bank to try to do a bit those tax guides. Now they're not as precise maybe as what you suggest, but they do try to link, um, you know, to think of this idea of appropriate tax policies given given the constraints. Um, in the more research side, I think what happens is we often try to find a proxy or sufficient statistic, if you want, for a given level. You know, there's something interesting, you know, I work a lot with my co-author Anders Jensen has a really nice paper showing how he tries to explain why the personal income tax is so weak um, in a lot of poorer countries. And he directly related with the share of self-employed in the economy, right? And you can see that as this develops, you see the thresholds moving and policies developing. So, so in that sense, you can think of for some specific policies, you know, you might have some of the sufficient statistics, for example, the share of self-employed, or we could think, you know, for example, Howard University of Seattle has developed a nice index of complexity of an economy. I think that's a very interesting variable for something like the value added tax, you know, the more links you have across firms, probably the more information you will be able to generate, right? So more complex economies are in a better position for a given level of state capacity than less complex ones, right? So, so yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. I think we 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 don't have any. We've exhausted all the questions in the WebEx and and the, and the YouTube. And, and just to let you know, we had a, a, a sizable following on both platforms. Uh, so just attesting to the interest that everybody had in this topic. Um, I want to thank you, Pierre, for the presentation, and Marcelo for for making time to come and discuss and provide some really thoughtful reactions and and, and good specific ideas for for moving forward. Um, so with that, just thank you, everybody. And um, unless Pierre or Marcelo, you want to say again one last word, I think we'll call this uh, call this to an end. Um, so thank you very much. Bye, bye, everybody. Thank you very bye. much.
Great job, yeah. Thank you, Marcelo. Thanks, everyone.